we really want to be able to have whatever experience is there and not have to feel that that's uh, somehow a problem uh, or not okay for us to have. So if, you know, we really want to be able to allow whatever feelings are showing up at any given time, but, you know, if we feel that it's somehow wrong or bad or means something bad about me if I feel sad, um, that can mean that I, I then want to deny that or push that away or get rid of it. You're listening to the Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast, the show that blends science and heart to bring you evidence-based tips and tricks for cultivating a healthy, wealthy, and meaningful life. Now, here's your host, therapist, yogi, and fellow Full Life Balancer, Dr. Caitlin Harkis. Hi there. Welcome back to Wisdom for Wellbeing. Today, we are joined by Louise McHugh, a professor in psychology at the University College Dublin and a world-leading expert in contextual behavioral science. She has published over 90 papers in the area of behavioral science, and her work has been funded by national and international funding bodies. Louise has been a fellow of the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science since 2014 and is a peer-reviewed acceptance and commitment therapy trainer and an associate editor for the Journal of Contextual Behavioral Science. Louise is incredibly knowledgeable and skillful in the area of the self. Now, I kind of say this in air quotes here because what is the self? Well, this is exactly what Louise is going to be talking you through today. In the end, you will better understand your sense of self and the journey from childhood till now and the different parts of yourself that lead to this experience you're having in these moments. This is really useful because she talks you through different tools to actually cultivate a more healthful sense of self. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Louise herself now. Hi, Louise. Welcome to the Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast. I am so delighted to be with you here today. Thank you. Delighted to be here with you too. Um, and we were talking about how, you know, we're connecting via Zoom right now, but that's not so abnormal in the current atmosphere. So this actually feels like a really normal way of connecting and having a chat. Yeah, it's the same thing, different meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I guess with that, you know, it's unusual times, but I suppose everyone's going to be dealing with this a little bit differently. And it will be interesting to link that into the conversation that we have today around the concept of self. And I kind of should be saying that in air quotes and what that means. But before we introduce this, you know, incredible topic that is so relevant to all of us, would you mind just sharing a little bit about who you are and the work you're doing? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm Louise McHugh and I am a professor at University College Dublin in Ireland um, and I run a research lab there, um, the Contextual Behavioural Science uh, Research Lab, which looks at acceptance and commitment therapy and its underlying theory. Um, and so we publish research papers in the area and then I'm particularly interested in the area of the self and perspective taking um, and how that's relevant to acceptance and commitment therapy, but also just interested in the development of the self uh, and perspective taking as skills that we humans have, uh, essential skills. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think that's me. Would you mind just sharing for the audience a little bit about what, I guess, to start off contextual behavioral science is? <laughs> Yeah, well, so contextual behavioral science is um, it's sort of, it's, it's a, it is a larger term that sort of encapsulates um, a philosophical approach uh, to human behavior that likes to look at the behavior in the context in which it occurs. And it sort of doesn't see behavior in isolation, but it, it sees that the whole context, what came before, what comes after, and um, the history of the individual, that all of that is part of uh, what determines what behavior they'll engage in at any given time. Um, and then contextual behavioral science also uh, encompasses a, a theory of language, thought, cognition. Um, so, you know, all those thinking, reasoning processes that we humans engage in. Um, 
And then sort of the clinical application um, is acceptance and commitment therapy uh, or training. And by clinical application, here we're referring to something that someone might work with, with a therapist, for instance, as a way of moving forward to creating a life that's really valuable and vital to them. Yeah. So acceptance and commitment therapy can be used to help people when they're having struggles with their thoughts and feelings or experiences. Uh, And also it can be uh, acceptance and commitment training can be used to help people to accelerate performance um, when they want that edge, maybe in sporting um, context or work context. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a clinical uh, therapeutic um, or a behavioral change approach that helps all humans to be able to relate more effectively with their uh, thoughts and feelings, um, which we're having all the time. <laughs> so it's, it's <laughs> yeah. a, It's good to be able to have a good relationship with them. And I think that word relate is a really interesting one because that's quite key in the work you do, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So the theory of the theory of language and cognition that that this contextual behavior science, the, the theory of language and cognition at the heart of it looks at the reason humans are able to communicate and plan and categorize and reason in such sophisticated ways that um, that, that outreach the, the sophistication that other species might have in their communication is because we are able to relate things in terms of each other. And we do that um, all the time in, in arbitrary ways. So for example, if I'm thinking about uh, myself, uh, I might be thinking about, am I good at that? Am I better than that person at that? Uh, am I good enough? Uh, am I the same as a, a, a woman? Am I different to a man? Um, we, we will relate to ourselves in those type of ways. And that is that capacity to relate. Um, and the way we do it is, is based on our learning history and context. That relating is at the, is at the heart of um, complex, complex human behavior, really. Um, yeah. And with that, so the self comes into all of this. This is, you know, your area of passion. You've written a few books on this area and this concept of the self, you know, we all have perhaps uh, a self, but what, what is that? Is it something that's stable through time? Would you mind just giving us a bit of an overview? Yeah. So the, the self is something that's been of interest to all philosophers, psychologists over the ages. And, you know, our relationship with ourself is the most important relationship we have because <laughs> we're everywhere we go. <laughs> so we can't get away from ourselves. Um, but there is a, a little bit of a, an, an illusion to, to in the, the self that we think we are. Um, so when you kind of ask people, you know, where's your core self? They will typically point inwards to their, their, their head, their brain area. Um, and when they're doing that, um, they're sort of missing the impact of the environment and the context in the way that they're describing, evaluating themselves. Um, so we sort of have this, this story about ourselves that we, we, in, we readily talk about. Um, and you'll notice in the next conversation that you have, or even at the beginning of this conversation, you know, I would tell a bit about myself. Um, and if we weren't able to do that, you know, if we weren't able to, to just talk about ourselves and evaluate and describe ourselves, th- that would be very strange. <laughs> be very strange in an interview, be very strange when you're meeting somebody new. Um, but when we're doing that, we're sort of only really seeing a limited part of ourselves, um, which, is, which is the story about what we've come to evaluate ourselves as. Um, but from the acceptance and commitment therapy or context of a science point of view, really there is more to us than the stories because actually the stories are just ways we've learned to relate to ourselves. Um, so for example, I wouldn't be uglier, smarter, funnier, more stupid than if there wasn't other people to relate to. So the ways we describe ourselves are actually in relation to others. If there was no one else on the planet, I just would be. (laughs) Um, But as soon as there are other people there to relate to, then I start to become better at tennis, (laughs) uh, worse at maths, 
you know, whatever that is. And then that starts to feed into who I describe Louise McHugh to be. Okay. So there's this relation to this sort of, as you said earlier, the context and that it's something that then, I guess these, these judgments, these uh, rel- relativities that then pushes us to certain behaviors or stories that we experience as ourselves. Yeah. So what we have is we have a, a perspective. So across all my life, I have, I always see things from my perspective. So, you know, me when I was five, saw things from my perspective, me today see things from my perspective. And that's the actual thing that's stable. But we don't think of it like that. We think what the thing that is us is the stories that we learned to say about ourselves. Um, so the way we, so those, and we don't encourage each other to think about, oh, you're relating to yourself as good at that or bad at that. You know, we, we don't talk like that or notice that. We, we encourage uh, each other to give firm evaluations about who we are, like as if they are who we are. You know, so I'm somebody who's honest. You know, we would encourage, if someone says that, we would buy that, believe that. Um, and actually, while we might notice inconsistencies in other people's, the way that they describe themselves and actual way they behave. And um, so if your friend said they're honest and then they told a lie, you, 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 you notice that. We're, we don't like to notice that in, in out with our own behavior. So if I say I'm an honest person, and then I tell a lie. That's very uncomfortable because, you know, I'm attached to this story that I'm honest. And then I will do things like, you know, um, oh, that wasn't I wasn't myself when I did that. <laughs> or, you know, that was the wine talking or, you know, some variant of why that wasn't me. Um, and, and that's sort of being caught in this idea that there's a me that's a story that's the, the stable thing. And then there's other behaviors that are not like me rather than all of these behaviors are me. And I'm a witness to all of them. Um, yeah. That makes that makes sense. And it's, it is really interesting because I can immediately think of when I notice inconsistencies. And I suppose in this conversation, I'm reflecting on where I do <laughs> the backpedaling to explain behaviors or, you know, I maybe experience certain emotions because of something that I've done and go, oh, that's because that wasn't really me or it's not something I would do. So it's a very interesting way of looking at how we step back into this perspective. Yeah. And, you know, we want... We really want to be able to have whatever experience is there and not have to feel that that's uh, somehow a problem uh, or not okay for us to have. So if, you know, we really want to be able to allow whatever feelings are showing up at any given time. But, you know, if we feel that it's somehow wrong or bad or means something bad about me, if I feel sad, um, that can mean that I, I then want to deny that or push that away or get rid of it. And, and, you know, sort of what we, we know about experiences is that they come and go, they vary. But if we try to stop them just coming and going in their natural way, like struggle with them, try to deny them, distort them, um, they kind of stick around. Until, they stick around for longer and the, the struggle makes them be more present for us. So if I work really hard in the world not to let myself feel uh, anxiety, a lot of anxiety will show up for me continually. Um, whereas what we would prefer is that people can sort of witness and allow whatever feelings come and go, just as experiences that they're having, that they they can be spacious and witness them. Um, and the same with thoughts. We want them to be able to, well, really just notice that all thoughts are just ways we're relating to the world. It's just ways we're categorizing and evaluating the world. Um, and we don't need to get hung up on whether those evaluations about myself or about anything in the world is true or not true, it's more that we want to start to think about, these are ways I'm, I'm relating and categorizing the world. Does this way of relating work to help me move in directions that matter? Or does this way of relating to the world actually stop me and make my life a bit smaller? The, the vital question is, is, does this work? Does it work to help me show up in the way that I would like to? Yes. And so context of science and that philosophy underlying it, um, when we look at behavior and context, that phil- philosophical approach, that what's true from that philosophical approach is what works. Okay. So in lots of philosophical approaches, uh, the truth criterion is accurate description. Um, and actually for much of psychology and much of science, a mechanistic approach, philosophical approach is about that 
accurately describing. Um, but when, when we're looking at human behavior, we don't want to just accurately describe it. We want to look at what works to get this person access to good stuff in their lives, reinforcers in their lives, and uh, natural reinforcers. So work, what works is what's true. And yeah, when we're coming back and looking at the self, when we're looking at anything from this point of view, we're trying to think about orienting the client towards don't get stuck on what's true and what's not true. Look at what works for you in your life. Okay. So it's this idea of workability and you use um, in your books, the term healthy selfing. I like that you kind of turn it into an adjective. Would you mind describing what exactly is healthy selfing? And then we could look at what unhealthy selfing is um, after. So, you know, because self sort of puts it into this word that that, that, that limits it again to like a, a noun or a description. And really, it, this is an action, you know, like the engaging in the in the behavior of describing and evaluating my, myself is it's, it's like dancing or running or typing. It's a behavior that we engage in. Um, and if we can sort of shift to, to noticing that when I'm, when I'm um, in a space where thoughts like I'm not good enough, I'm a failure, I'm rubbish, I mean, that's selfing that I'm engaging in. It's an action of describing and evaluating myself. Um, but just to get that comprehensive distance to notice that this is an, an, you know, it's the behavior I'm engaging in. It's not a fact about who I am um, fundamentally. Okay, so the and the behaviors that we're engaging in, if they're ones that are helpful in regards and, and workable, then those would be ones that are associated with healthy selfing. They're helping us move forwards to create a life where we're feeling like we're we're thriving, we're being our best self, so to speak. Yeah. So, like, what we really want to do to promote like that sort of healthy selfing repertoire for clients is, we first of all want them to sort of notice that their experiences there's a variability in experience. So that stops it being scary to uh, just acknowledge the thought of being boring or the feeling of sadness, because it's like, look, they will vary. These thoughts will vary. It's not gonna always be this way. Um, And then when they see that variability in the story and the feelings, um, that sort of can make room for you to build out this piece that, but there is something stable. There is a a healthy selfing repertoire that's stable. That is, you are the witness you witness all of the thoughts, feelings, evaluations, stories, experiences across your life. And I think that's important because when you start um, working with showing people that your experiences vary, your story varies, you vary, um, that can feel really a bit uh, destabilizing because, you know, we all want to have a stable sense of me in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's when you want to build in that piece that there is something that is you that can never be damaged in any way you witness all your experiences and that is uniquely and stably you um, and when we're doing that we want to help the uh, client or the person we're working with to see that um, your thoughts and feelings and experiences they're not different to you they're just parts of you um, so we want to make that sort of broader piece of you know you're the witness these are just parts of you they vary across time and context and place um, And I suppose then the important thing is from the place where you're a witness of these experiences, rather than getting entangled in them or trying to fight them or pretend they're not true and deny them, um, then you are able to respond. So we sort of want that, given your history to date, how could it be any other way than you bought the story and and fought the story, the whole, you know, the whole context in which we're living, the whole social context supports us believing our stories about ourselves. So it's not that you're to blame, but actually now you are able to respond. So if you change your behaviors, um, if you just behave in directions that are matter to you, um, things, things will change actually um, for you. Um, so you don't have to wait for the stories or the feelings to be right, to be able to move into a direction that is workable for you. Um, So we want that, you know, your experiences vary, you're the witness of them, they're just parts of you, but with them there, you can still choose the directions that you want to go in. And at that point, we would see that that would be sort of what we would see as a healthy selfing repertoire. 
And with the directions that matter, you know, one of the issues that you highlighted as a common self issue is this lack of clarity about values um, and the directions that matter would be values. So would you mind just defining that quickly for the audience? Because that's a key, a key part of this, isn't it? Yeah, well, not knowing. So like if you, you know, for some people, they could for, for various reasons. Um, you can be not clear on what's important to you. So every, all, I'm sure all practitioners will have worked with people who will say when they, they come into session, when they're trying to get them to think about what really matters to you, um, that they'll just be like, I, I just, I just don't, I just, I don't, don't have a clue. Um, and I've never thought about that before. And some of the, the various different sort of histories that can, can lead to that, but, um, some of it can be uh, where there was a you know a sort of an absence of uh, emotional talk in the home growing up, uh, so the person didn't really get to discriminate um, their different internal feelings to know what their wants and and, and not likes are. So early on. Um, when we're feeling things, um, we want to be able to name them. <laughs> and we want to be able to name if, if I'm feeling angry or sad. Uh, and we want to be able to do it as much as possible in line with the way that the rest of the people in our culture are naming them. <laughs> because otherwise it'll be a very confusing world. Like if I'm, if I'm labeling a feeling of little bit of annoyance as anger, <laughs> I'm gonna be pretty confused when I'm interacting with people and they're telling me what, what it's like for them to be angry. Um, but, how we learn to label these things is from other people who are telling us that we're feeling these things. So like a child will learn that, the parents, oh, you're sad now, you seem sad. But they can't see inside what the child is feeling when they're telling them that that's what they're feeling. So it's other people that are trying to, are teaching us when we're young uh, what the internal feelings are. Uh, and if, they, if we sort of incorrectly learn some of those, or if we don't really get that sort of literacy around the emotions, that can make it hard for us to know what we want. Um, and other ways in which that hard to know what we want can be, can be um, if we have sort of very authoritarian caregivers that sort of tell us what we want um, and don't sort of allow us to, to look at our track or our own experience of what we want at any given time. Well, then we can sort of become um, what that might look like as an adult is where well, you're very good at knowing what other people might want you to want. <laughs> Um, but you're not very good at tracking into your own experience about what you want. Now, of course, there's, there's varying different ways in which it can manifest that somebody can present um, where they, they're struggling to be able to uh, acknowledge what matters to them. Um, and then there's various ways that we can sort of come at trying to help people to connect to that then, you know. So this is actually, I think, really interesting because listeners might be sitting here going, oh, that's something I experienced. You know, maybe I feel like I have a lack of clarity as to who I am or where I'm going or what I want. And they might be thinking, oh, maybe that happened when I was growing up. Maybe that's what was going on for me. Would you mind sharing a bit about maybe some of the ways that we move forward in our lives, you know, that we move from childhood to now and move into this understanding we have of ourself or different skills we have to relate to our experience. Yeah, so, so early on, um, we, we, we need to, as I said, we need to learn to be able to label our experiences. And then over time, we learn how to be able to discriminate my experience here and now from other people's experiences there and then. And we learn that that's a way of relating as well. I hear now different to you there then. Um, and through that relating, we start to discriminate that, oh, at times I want different things that, than you want. You have different wants, wishes and desires to me. Um, and so if some of those repertoires aren't in place uh, for a young, uh, when people are younger, and if they really aren't in place in, in a, in a uh, you could have social communication difficulties, but if they're just not um, very well put in place, then you could go along to adulthood, but you could have uh, some uh, trouble knowing what your wants are or your values are. So it won't, so for example, somebody who might end up with a diagnosis um, that involves social communication deficits, such as those diagnosed in the autistic spectrum, um, with autistic spectrum conditions, it could be that some of that internal labeling and that perspective taking repertoire wasn't uh, honed in um, early on. 
but then for somebody else they mightn't end up with uh, meeting the criteria for um for that particular diagnosis but they might have trouble being able to discriminate uh, what's important to them uh, and then if you if if you're in that situation um or if you're working with someone in that situation um things that you might want to do are to encourage um coming back to discriminating your internal experiences. Um, and as we see a lot of mindfulness practices are actually about coming back in and noticing our internal experiences and the external world. Um, and so things that we might want to do is even as simple as thinking, you know, if like, I really just don't know what I feel in, in different situations. Well, well, okay, let's do something like hold your breath. Where do you sense that? Where do you feel that? Let your breath go. Is there a difference? <laughs> and then starting, and then then you know putting the person into different scenarios that are likely to evoke happy or sad, uh, and just getting them to start to discriminate where those feelings are and what they're like. Um, but that's sort of the extreme end. And then for somebody who is just uh, probably is able to discriminate their internal experiences, but still hasn't been very good at figuring out what they want. Mm-hmm. Um, there are ways to come in at that. And I think a good way to do that is to use a, a relation of opposition. Because, yeah, so if you sort of say to somebody that, um, you know, what do you want? That that question itself can just bring up the shutters uh, for some people. Um, and so one thing to do, well, one thing to do can be give, you, you might have, well, in act sometimes they give lots of different cards with different particular values on them and people sort them out and, and figure out what they uh the ones that they care about um but if they're particularly confused i think an opposition can be easier because we usually know what we don't like <laughs> um and so something you can do is just something that's fun and engaging and just say okay i want you to think of somebody who in the popular media lives their life in a way that you would never want to be like like you just think i would never want to be like that person um and you know people can answer that even if they're thinking i don't know who, who what i want to be about they can answer that question they'll, they'll think of somebody that they think yeah i hate who they are um and then you just asking them well what is it about the way they live their life what is it about the qualities that they bring to the world that are what you would not want to be um and they might, you know, might be something like selfish or um, it might be intolerant, you know, and then saying, OK, well, let's flip that over. What's the opposite for you of selfish um, and intolerant? And then they might say, well, the opposite is, you know, to be um, compassionate and caring, you know, and it, and, you know, it's, it's just for them, whatever the opposite is to them. Yeah. Then you're starting that conversation. So then it's like, OK, well, now these seem like things that might qualities you want to bring in your life and let's see how we can go about trying to um, move you towards bringing those qualities to your life that's really beautiful and that's really easy to access you know as you were saying it I was able to immediately think of a few people who <laughs> you know, came to mind particularly in this current context that we're we're living in right now so that's something that I think would be really powerful for listeners to be able to in their minds even just take a few moments right now and bring to mind someone and then think okay well after I finish listening to this interview I'll sit down and write out what are the opposites what are the things that I would like to be embodying in my life yeah you also, you know, you mentioned this idea of mindfulness and that holding your breath, for instance, was a way of just noticing in a really simple way. I've, I haven't heard of that as a mindfulness exercise before, and I love it because it's so simple and it's a way to notice. Would you be able to describe mindfulness and how we might be able to use that as a stepping stone to experiencing ourselves? <laughs> so, um, yeah, when, so when I mentioned the holding of the breath, I was imagining like it's a simple discrimination early on for somebody just to start to orient towards noticing, oh, I can look internally at differences in my experience. Um, and then with, with, the, with mindfulness practice, you know, I, I think a lot of that is, it's, it's learning different discriminations in our experience um, and being able to track our experience. And as well, you know, sort of in, in various different practices, it's, um, getting back in touch with our experience in a world where we have lost a lot of touch and also where we've lost a lot of using our experience as a guide to our, our actual behavior. And um, so really a lot of the practices um, that 
uh, are engaged in, in, in mindfulness-based interventions and also in acceptance and commitment therapy are trying to bring people back to notice your own experience. Don't fight it and distort it and think it's something that's bad to have. Um, because really, actually, our own experience is the only thing <laughs> that we actually have. So we don't want to be distorting that. Um, when, but you know, about 40 years ago, when Steve Hayes, who's the you know sort of founding father of acceptance and commitment therapy, where a lot of this started was he was doing research on um, the, the fact that humans can follow rules, uh, and it's a really big advantage that we can do that. So, like you know, you can teach a dog to sit and to run and to do various things if when you you know directly give them the the food item afterwards, so they learn it. But with humans, like we have this ability that I can give you a rule now and you could follow it in 10 years. Like I could say, when you come to Dublin, visit Trinity College Dublin. And in 10 years time, you could actually do that and, and, and experience the consequences of following that rule. Um, and Steve was interested in just looking at, well, looking at the advantages of rule following versus learning by your experience. Um, and so in various experiments, they did things like, uh, okay, uh, the aim is people have to get points on the computer. Um, some people, I want you to just figure out, you, you there now, you have to figure out how to get points and then they'd fiddle around and eventually figure out, oh, you press the space where you get points. So they learn by their experience versus a group where they say, okay, you press the space bar and you get points. <laughs> and so obviously that group immediately has the advantage, the learning advantage. Yeah, great, I can press the space bar, that's easy. Um, but then what they did was they, they switched the contingency it no longer got you points that pressing of the space bar. The rule was now wrong. Um, but people who learned by their experience changed what they did really quickly when the rule was outdated. But people who had learned by following the rule kept following the rule when it was not working for them. And when Steve was looking at that and his colleagues were looking at that, they were noticing that, wow, there's language processes <laughs> that we have like rule following actually can mean that we engage in behaviors that are not working from our experience, but we're not noticing. We're just following the rule, following the rule, following the rule, wondering why we're not, not, you know, not feeling vital and satisfied, but we're literally following rules that society or our parents or we picked up somewhere and it's outdated. So mindfulness practice can help us to come back to our experience, to sit with our experience, to learn to track our experience, um, to not be so dislocated and just following rules blindly without noticing, do they work, do they not? One of my uh, colleagues, Emily Sandos, was given a good example of the a funny example of following outdated rules. She's saying that at Christmas, they used to cut the turkey, they had their granny's recipe, they used to cut the turkey in half and cook the first bit and then cook the second bit. And they asked her, her granny uh, a few years later, why, why is it that you cut the turkey in half and cut the two different parts? And the granny's like, oh no, we just had a tiny oven. So we can follow these rules blindly. Um, in so many, in, and they're all over the place rules, in the, the rules that we're following in the world, you know, from it's, you know, uh, my mother thought it would be good to get a medical degree. So I should do medicine to, to you know, um, what clothes you should wear, to what weight you should be. You know, like they're, they're, they're everywhere, right? They're, they're, they're bombarded by these rules that we're so easily able to follow. Uh, and yet what the cost is, we don't actually look at, is this working for me? <laughs> So this ability to step back and look at whether something, again, that that criteria of workability, is this working for me? And mindfulness can give us a little bit of space to step back and notice what's going on for us and to explore those experiences rather than getting into the habit of habitually rule following without perhaps, I guess, holding in question some of our behaviors. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, and I, and I think it's really important in our relationship with ourself. I think this like... Um, in Dublin, there is a ring road around the city, just goes all the way around it. And it's called the M50, Motorway 50. And it's, and it, you know, I think with your relationship with yourself, you can be on the M50 driving around it. And in principle, you are in Dublin, you know, <laughs> but you actually see none of Dublin when you're there. So if you're out in the periphery and unwilling to look at all sorts of aspects of your experience that you don't want to see, uh, you, you, you'll, yeah, you'll, your relationship with Dublin and, and your experience of Dublin is going to be pretty limited. Whereas if you come off the M50 and you start to, you know, sit with 
learn to get back in touch with and explore all of your feelings. There will be, you know, when you come into Dublin, you're going to see some stuff you don't want to, you know, you're going to see a really bad homelessness problem. Um, you're probably going to see a lot of rubbish after nights out. Um, but if you don't go into the city, you're not going to see Trinity College Dublin. You're not going to see the Guinness factory and have a Guinness there. You're not going to see, you know, the, the you know, the Liffey uh, River going through the city. So really, you know, if we come back in, in context of experiences and don't fear seeing some of the, the things that we might deem negative, um, what we do is we really get to fully experience ourselves um, as a witness. Without So it, it means that we we're not in this place of just distorting our experience to try to make it sanitized and good when really that actually just starts to limit and make our life very small. That's an interesting way of describing it, you know, that we are then removed from what might be some of the, I guess, challenges, so to speak, or uncomfortable experiences of seeing, for instance, the homelessness, but I guess how we would relate this to ourselves, what might be some of the difficult experiences that we would have? Would it be, you know, anxiety, for instance, or what are some of the common challenges people have? Yeah, I think that there's so many um, emotions, first of all, that we think that we should not have, that there's something wrong with us if we have them. So I, one is shame, um, shame, anxiety, rejection, regret, um, sadness, anger, um, embarrassment. And, you know, the thing is that all of those emotions, we could have them in an hour, you know, we could have them in a day, we could have them every day. Um, and, but if we're really working hard and that thinking that if I have some of them that, that I'm fundamentally wrong, um, and I think shame is one, you know, when, when, when I feel ashamed of something that I did, you know, it's, it, it, you know, it's never easy to lean into shame. Um, but what I really notice is if I try to push back from shame, it really gets me behaving in ways that are not good. So like if I'm really trying to pretend that I'm not ashamed of something, well, then I'll start defending why I did what I did. And rather than being able to let it just go sooner, I'm now going to be trying to justify why what I did was actually okay and, and off on that tangent, which, you know, that's a bad road to nowhere. So, you know, if I fire off a text and kick off a fight with somebody and I feel ashamed then that, oh, I probably shouldn't have done that. No, no, I was right. And now these are all the reasons why I was right. I'm going to double down. That's not useful, right? What I would prefer to be able to do is notice, oh, I'm having the experience of shame right now. And that, you know, that's here, that, that's here. And that probably tells me that I, 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 I don't want to continue down that path of that argument or whatever it might be. So we want to be able to allow all of the feelings and of course then thoughts, right? Our, our thoughts about ourselves, some of them can be and are uh, very negative. And actually we um, were just looking at, we had asked different students to say a, a negative thought that they were struggling with in a study. And we were just looking yesterday at the different categories of what were coming up and 50% of their thoughts were, were really hateful thoughts about their body. Um, and then the, uh, another group of them were about being failures and another group were about being unlovable. So if you wanted to team them, they were the three sort of big uh, groupings of thoughts that we really struggle with. Um, and, and that's all of us, right? So I, yeah, I suppose- Yeah, how normalizing. That, yeah, how normalizing, right? Um, so I think it's, you know, what we, we, yeah. So I think that the things that we might not want are our thoughts about, um, crappy thoughts about the, the way we look and, the, and, and our body, crappy thoughts about being good enough and able and competent and um, being a failure. And, and then I suppose all that stuff around being frightened of being rejected and not being lovable or deep down with something being wrong and unworthy. Um, and, and because we relate things in the world, like that's the, the beginning of where the self comes from, it really couldn't be any other way other than we could come up with lots of ways in which we compare ourselves in ways that we don't match up because I can do it. I can compare something as better. <laughs> and once I can start doing that, I am going to be able to find ways in which I'm not as good. Um, so what we really want to do is notice that they're just thoughts and ways of relating to the world um, and not facts about who I am. Not, it doesn't, just because I think it, just because I relate that way, does not make it any more true or not and then again coming back to that piece does this work for me does believing that I'm a failure work for me in my life is it helping me or is it actually making my life smaller so we can have the thought without believing it and we can have the thought without it determining how we show up in our lives 
Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, we want to start to orient towards thinking, okay, I'm having the thought that I'm a failure. There's that old story that comes up for me all the time. Okay. But that story might be knocking around. Actually, that might tell me that there's something here that's important to me. Um, and just, just noticing what is important in this and believing that thought, is it really working for me right now? Or if, is that going to stop me moving towards something that I care about deeply? And that's similar to what you were describing when we think of, you know, someone maybe we don't like or we don't really respect in regards to having a place to look at our own values. So when we have a thought that's really uncomfortable, maybe we look at that and go, oh, what does that say about what is important to me? Yeah, I think so. Definitely. I think that we can always flip and look at in moments where there's something that we want to struggle against or a a feeling is coming up or a thought is coming up. I think there can be something that when we are just a witness of that, we can start to notice from our experience. Oh, that thought about being a failure seems to be particularly potent when I'm about to, to move in directions in my career that I want to. So that probably tells me I care about this, right? Or whatever it might be. And with, with that, so how do we cultivate this healthy sense of self? And I know in ACT language, um, psychological flexibility comes up. So would you mind just linking for us and maybe giving us some steps for those listeners who are going, oh, how do I, how do I move towards a healthier selfing? Yeah. So to move towards um, healthier selfing, we want to I guess we want to, on a daily or certainly um, regularly, uh, engage in practices that allow us to notice um, our thoughts as just thoughts and our feelings as feelings. And so we can do that through um, a sitting practice for whatever amount of time um, each day, or we can do that through one of the ACT exercises that, 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 that is used to help promote this idea of a healthier sense of self is um, where, where you get the, when you look at as an observer or a witness of different times in your life, just to notice that variability across time in the feelings and thoughts, uh, just to reconnect to, look, I'm a witness of these rather than that these are controlling me. Um, and if I can be a witness of these experiences, um, and I can cultivate that, that sense across time of thoughts are just thoughts and learning how to lean in and allow and make space compassionately for whatever feelings. Well, then it, that will make it much easier for me to flexibly move towards what matters to me. Um, it's good as well for us to take the time to really connect to what we want to be about and who we want to be about in the world. Um, and, and one way to do that is to, to flip that opposite. Um, and we can think about across domains in our life, um, in our friendships, in our intimate relationships, in our work, um, in our contribution and community, the things that matter to us in each of those areas of our life, who do we want to be? What qualities do we want to bring? And um, so it might be that in the area of parenting we want to be attentive in the area of work we might want to be contributing and we can sort of see who do I want to be in each pieces of my life and that helps me at any given time then to reorient towards the directions that matter um, to me and it's easier for me to do that if I've cultivated this practice where I'm a witness to my experiences rather than those experiences catching me and and getting me caught in I want to be better I want to be the best I want to look good and special um and rather than trying to think oh I don't I I can't bear this feeling of being ashamed so rather than in being stuck in those fights we want to just be like okay there's shame showing up and I'm having thoughts that I, I I wish I could look better and special and with all that what I want to do now is connect to my friend or whatever it might be So taking a step back each day to engage in some practices that allow us to notice thoughts as thoughts, feelings as feelings, and to have clarity as to how we do want to be showing up in our lives. So an exercise like you suggested, like the value sorting cards or thinking in opposition to what we, you know, have an example of what we don't want to be showing up as. And from there, working back to figure out what our values are, that these two practices are really going to help us sort of unhook and step back from some of these thoughts and move move forwards in our lives in a way that is meaningful to us yeah do you want me to do an exercise i would love that that's a beautiful way to um to finish things up for the listeners if, if you're okay with that 
good. Um, so we're, uh, what I'd like you to do is, and you don't even have to close your eyes, but if you're in front of a screen, <laughs> um, just turning your, your, your face away from the, the screen. We all need that at the moment. And I'd like you to just notice the sounds that you can hear right now. I'd like you to notice that what you can hear changes. Sometimes slightly, sometimes in a more pronounced way. And now I'd like you to just, with your eyes open, just scanning the room around you or the place around you, wherever you might be. I'd like you to notice that what you can see changes. And I'd like you to gently orient your attention to what your current sensations that you're feeling are. And it might be the feeling of your feet in your shoes, the tightness in your chest. Just noticing the sensations that you're currently feeling. I want you to notice that these sensations, they vary. They're also changing. And I want you to just bring to mind um, one way that you describe yourself. For me, that could be impulsive. But any description will do. Um, honest, silly, whatever. And I want you to just bring to mind, when is the time when you're not that description? or less that description. I want you to notice how accuracy of that description changes too. And noticing that there's a, a part of you, a witness, that notices the things you see, the things you hear, the sensations you feel, all the descriptions you make about yourself, all the experiences you have, that there's a witness that's always there while all the other aspects, they change across time. And from that place as the witness of these experiences, I want you to connect to those qualities that we talked about earlier um, that you want to bring to the world. So the opposite of somebody who <laughs> um, it's living a life you wouldn't want to live or being about things you wouldn't want. 
you know, for me, that was connection and understanding. And I want you to think from that place as a witness, where you can notice all these experiences and they come and go and change. What's something you can do today that's about that person you want to be? So for me, connected and understanding. What's something you can do today that's about that? No matter what thoughts about yourself or feelings show up, um, not getting into the fight with our minds and our, our, our feelings, but rather connecting to who you want to be and letting that be your guide. And then just gently extending compassion and kindness to yourself. Thank you for sharing that with me. That was lovely. What a gift. Thank you so much, Louise. I think this is a really nice note to finish off on this idea of extending, you know, compassion to ourselves as we move forwards and hopefully, you know, moving forwards with that direction in our day as to healthy selfing, moving forward in a way that is important to us and in alignment with who we want to be showing up as in this world. And, you know, I guess normalizing too you mentioned that we have the experience commonly of body shame or feeling like we're a failure or we're unlovable to normalize that and to know that we can have those experiences and that doesn't have to be who we're showing up as that we can still be healthy selfing with those experiences and orientating towards what matters with a real kindness and gentleness for ourselves. yeah absolutely how can listeners connect with you? Just before before you go, you um, mentioned that you have Twitter and Facebook. What, where would people look? Cool. Yeah, so you can um, follow me on Twitter. I'm Louise McHugh on there. And you can also email me at louise.mchugh at ucd.ie. Um, and also um, you can friend me on Facebook. <laughs> My Facebook's a very open place. Um, and yeah. Yeah. And two books. So clinicians might be interested in um, contextual behavioral guide to the self as well as um, self and perspective taking. And even if you're not a clinician, I know before, um, before I ended up going down the route of clinician, I sometimes read books directed for clinicians and found them incredibly informative. So if this conversation has resonated with people, I think they would also enjoy to explore those resources too. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Louise. I will um, put those contact details in the show notes as well. And yeah, thank you so much for your time and for a beautiful meditation. Mind yourselves. Oh, that's a beautiful note to finish on. So how are you feeling about yourself? I very much hope that you enjoyed this episode with Dr. Louise McHugh. I think she does a really wonderful job of teaching us the science because understanding the science, the research, the frameworks underpinning our experience of our sense of self, I think is really empowering as well as then providing us some practical strategies to reconnect with this part of ourselves that has traveled through time and this self that we're going to be showing up with every day, every moment for the rest of our lives. You can, of course, head to the show notes at drcaitlin.com to refresh some of the concepts and to get more information. And please, if you do have a moment, leave a review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this podcast. I would so much appreciate it because it's really useful in spreading the word about wisdom for well-being. And just a heads up, leaving a review on iTunes is not as simple as one might expect it to be. So if you have any difficulties, I've made a little video that is above the show notes episodes at drcaitlin.com. Of course, feel free to flick me an email, hello at drcaitlin.com if you have any issues, and I will very happily send back some information. I appreciate this gift and you taking the time and for all of your ongoing support. All right. See you next week. Bye for now.
Thanks for joining us this week on the Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast. Please visit drcaitlin.com to connect, find show notes, other episodes, and to subscribe. While you're at it, if you find value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating or perhaps simply tell a friend about the show. Wisdom for Wellbeing is not a substitute for professional, individualized mental health treatment. If you are in crisis, please contact 000, your local emergency number if you are outside of Australia, or attend your local hospital ED.